and thank you for joining us today for the webinar, Improving Smoking Cessation Interventions Among People Living with HIV. My name is Stephanie Myers, and I will be your WebEx host. Before I move into introducing our moderator for today, I'd like to make a few comments. All lines have been muted upon entry and will remain muted for the duration of the webinar. Please submit your questions throughout the presentation in the Q&A or chat panel and select all panelists from the dropdown. We will ask them on your behalf during the Q&A portion of the webinar. Questions about specific aims will not be addressed during this webinar. If you need to view live captioning, please refer to the media viewer panel. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted online in the near future. And now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Michelle Block, Chief of the Tobacco Control Research Branch within the Behavioral Research Program at the National Cancer Institute. Thank you very much, Stephanie, and let me welcome all of you to this webinar on the Funding Opportunity Announcement, Improving Smoking Cessation Interventions Among People Living with HIV. I'm just going to walk us through a couple of quick slides before I turn this webinar over to the Program Director uh, in charge of this FOA, uh, Dr. Annette Kaufman. Uh, so the two technical experts who are joining us on the webinar are, as I began, Dr. Annette Kaufman, who is a program director at the National Cancer Institute, and Dr. Rick Verzon at the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities. So our agenda for today our first, we're going to give you information about the grant overview, then the request for applications that we have uh, published, the goals and purpose, the background, uh, quite a bit of detailed information, and then we're going to take your questions about the funding opportunity announcement. Um, I want to stress that we cannot answer questions about individual specific aims or details of individual grant applications those are better addressed in conjunction with uh, calls to the program directors involved. So, uh, what we are discussing today are requests for applications, which is a particular form of a funding opportunity announcement. RFAs, as we refer to them, have a specific receipt date or date. They provide an estimate of the amount of funds that have been dedicated to the initiative by the various institutes involved, an estimate of the number of awards we are likely to fund, and they also include specific criteria for scientific peer review, which are over and above those of the normal peer review. In addition, we also discuss, or excuse me, we also will explain how the RFA is reviewed by a specific scientific review group, and this is standard for RSAs. We are using two different types of grant mechanisms for this R01, and I know that many of you will be familiar with the differences between an R01 and R21, but for any of those on the phone who are not, I want to just walk us briefly through the difference. Uh, let's begin with the R21, the Exploratory Developmental Grant, which is an NIH mechanism that, as the slide says, encourages new exploratory and developmental research projects. It is sometimes used for simple pilot and feasibility studies. It is limited to only two years of funding, and the combined budget for direct costs which is usually the two-year project period, may not exceed $275,000. R21s do not require preliminary studies um, for submission. In contrast, many of you will be familiar with R01, our NIH Research Project Grant, which supports a discrete, specified, and circumscribed research project. They are the most common grant mechanism that is used at NIH. There is not, in general, a specific dollar amount limited unless it is specified in the funding opportunity announcement. And in general, R01s require advanced permission if you, were, or if you are proposing to spend 
$100,000 or more in direct costs in any given year. Generally, R01s will run or are awarded for three to five years. So with that, I'm going to talk, uh, turn the podium, so to speak, over to my colleague, Dr. Annette Kaufman, who will talk, walk us through the specifics of this particular funding opportunity announcement. Thank you, Dr. Block. Again, I'm Annette Kaufman, a program director in the Tobacco Control Research Branch at the National Cancer Institute, and I'll be walking us through these specific um, requests for applications for improving smoking cessation interventions among people living with HIV. Here are some of the award details. We plan to fund both R01s and R21s, up to three awards in each category. For the R01s, we intend to commit $2 million in fiscal year 2019, and for the R21s, we intend to commit $1 million in fiscal year 2019 for this mechanism. The goal of this RFA is to support studies to improve smoking cessation treatment among people living with HIV in the U.S. And I want to draw your attention to the Trans-NIH Plan for HIV-Related Research from fiscal year 2018. This RFA directly addresses the high priority area of HIV-associated comorbidities, co-infections, and complications. And this RFA has responsiveness to the 2018 Trans-NIH Plan built into it and addresses the cross-cutting areas of health disparities, behavioral and social science research, and informs dissemination efforts to decrease the incidence of tobacco-related disease and death. The overarching purpose of this RFA is to support R01 and R21 grants that systematically test as existing evidence-based smoking cessation interventions, that is a combination of behavioral and pharmacological therapies, and or to develop and test adaptations of these existing evidence-based smoking cessation interventions among people living with HIV. I'm now going to cover some of the background um, research that was the impetus for putting these RFAs out. Um, but first, I want to highlight that people living with HIV are not a homogenous group and have diverse backgrounds, demographics, life circumstances, and culture. So it's important for us to acknowledge the diversity of this population and keep that in mind as I describe the next few slides. I want to start first by describing cancer among people living with HIV. We know that antiretroviral therapy has led to a decline in AIDS-related mortality and increased life expectancy for these individuals. But now, non-AIDS-defining cancers are the leading non-AIDS cause of death. And in particular, smoking-related cancers occur at higher rates for people living with HIV. Lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer death among people living with HIV. It's diagnosed a decade or more earlier than in the general population. And recently, it's been estimated that 94% of lung cancer diagnoses could be potentially prevented by eliminating cigarette smoking. Now to turn to tobacco use among people living with HIV. While we've had great um, success in driving down tobacco use rates in the general population, there are still some subgroups that are still disproportionately affected by tobacco. Currently in the U.S., it's estimated that over 1.1 million people are living with HIV, and an estimated 40% of those individuals smoke cigarettes, and that's compared to just 15% in the general population. Also, people living with HIV who use tobacco suffer greater morbidity and mortality. It's estimated that their life expectancy is reduced by at least 16 years for those who smoke cigarettes. And in the general population, those who smoke, their life expectancy is reduced by 11 to 12 years. And again, getting back to the diversity of the population, we don't know how to tailor or best structure or deliver our tobacco cessation interventions to address the multifaceted and unique needs of this population. This diagram shows an important interplay um, between the patient, provider, and system and contextual level factors and shows what tobacco cessation challenges might exist specifically for people living with HIV. 
We expect that the applications that come in under this RFA will address one or more of these unique challenges. At the patient level, it's unclear if our existing treatments will be effective or if modifications will increase their effectiveness. At the provider level, there's a great need for education and training among providers for people living with HIV. And at the system and contextual level, um, cessation treatment is not the standard of care, and there's um, diverse healthcare settings for these patients. We need to better understand how these factors work together to potentially drive down smoking rates among people living with HIV. There have been several literature reviews. I'm going to highlight this one, Smoking Cessation for People Living with HIV AIDS, by Drs. Ledgerwood and Seek. They concluded that there have been few studies that have assessed the efficacy of tobacco cessation treatment. The types of treatments they looked at were behavioral, technology-assisted, and medication. They also concluded that those studies that do exist, many of them lack rigorous methods. So they lack randomization of participants to conditions, comparison conditions, treatment fidelity assessments, abstinence verification tests, and others. So there is a very strong need to build the science in this area. That brings me to um, the RFA details. So all of this information can be found in the language of the RFA that you can find online, but I just want to highlight some important pieces for you. First off, all projects must include the following. All projects have to be consistent with the highest HIV AIDS research priorities as identified by NIH. And you can see the notice OD 15137 for details. Another important thing you can refer to is that trans NIH plan um, for HIV related research. Also, all projects have to include one control or comparison group a detailed assessment of cigarette smoking and cigarette smoking history among study participants, including other tobacco product use, cessation endpoints and characteristics, markers of HIV AIDS immune status, and a feasible examination of HIV AIDS related co-infections and or comorbidities, and all projects must be designed for dissemination. Now I want to turn to, to responsiveness, and that includes projects that use an evidence-based tobacco cessation intervention. So the report on the right, Treating Tobacco Use and Dependence, the Clinical Practice Guideline from the Public Health Service, uh, the 2008 update, provides recommendations for clinical interventions and systems changes to promote the treatment of tobacco dependence. And they specifically called for randomized clinical trials among people living with HIV who smoke, examining the effectiveness of cessation interventions. These include FDA-approved pharmacotherapies in combination with behavioral interventions, which may include group counseling, individual counseling, telephone counseling, or mobile health platforms. I also think it might be important to talk about what might not be responsive to this RFA, and those are non-evidence-based tobacco cessation interventions. This includes other products, so products that would require a submission of an IND or an investigational new drug application, for, for example, e-cigarettes, and other therapies. So those may be complementary and alternative therapies that do not have a strong evidence base behind them for tobacco cessation. To continue on, um, and this page can be found in the RFA, non-responsive projects include applications or research projects focused on biological mechanisms or disease processes, studies that do not test an intervention that is intended to reduce cigarette smoking among PLWH, or people living with HIV, observational studies, studies that lack a control or comparison group, studies that do not employ non that employ non-evidence-based tobacco cessation interventions, and studies that do not provide a detailed assessment of cigarette smoking and cigarette smoking history. Other important information for you all to know is that applications will be evaluated by reviewers with relevant expertise in tobacco control and HIV. The R01's maximum project period is five years and requires preliminary studies, whereas R21s are two-year grants 
and are considered exploratory and do not require preliminary studies. Also, non-domestic or non-U.S. entities, such as foreign institutions, are not eligible to apply. The earliest submission date is December 8th, and we hope that you will submit a letter of intent 30 days prior to the application due date, which is January 8th. This letter of intent helps us plan for review, and our earliest start date will be September 2019 for these projects. I encourage you all to start the process early. Sometimes the grant systems can be a little tricky. I'm now going to turn it back to Dr. Michelle Block. Um, she's going to be moderating our question and answer panel. Great. Thank you very much, Annette. Uh, so I think we'll start with the first question. Uh, we have an applicant who asks more about the uh, review process for these applications. Would you want to say a bit more about that, please? Yeah, all applications that are submitted under this program announcement um, are going to be reviewed by a special emphasis panel that is convened specifically for this initiative. And they will have expertise specifically relevant to HIV and tobacco use and will include investigators um, who have been funded by our institutes in the past. Um, the R01s and R21s also will be reviewed by the same review group. Great. Thank you, Annette. Uh, you mentioned that foreign institutions are not eligible to apply to this FOA. Um, what FOA, if any, might they be eligible, or what other opportunities are there for uh, investigators from foreign institutions to work in this area? Yeah, so um, non-domestic entities are not eligible to apply to this particular RFA, but we have um, a sister um, program announcement, uh, funding opportunity announcement, um, that you may want to consider. Um, our colleague Mark Periscindola is the lead program director on that. Um, and the title of that one is Tobacco Use and HIV in Low and Middle Income Countries. Um, and uh, we can point you in that direction. If that's something you're interested in, please feel free to email me. Great. Thank you. Uh, we have someone asking, why is there only one receipt date for this particular RFA? That's a great question. Um, for RFAs, typically we only have one receipt date, um, and this is because the funds associated with the RFA have been approved and designated for use in fiscal year 2019. Okay, so to follow up on that, if someone uh, is unsuccessful in applying or for whatever reason misses the receipt, what, what advice would you give them? Um, they can always consider applying through the parent mechanism. Um, so. So this is responsive no matter what um, to NIH priorities, and so I would encourage them to consider the parent mechanism. We've had researchers apply um, with, with similar research ideas to what we're looking for for this RFA and be successful through that parent mechanism in the past. Great, thank you. Now, I know, we I know the RFA specifies uh, a particular number of awards. Uh, can you tell us more about how the funding decisions will eventually be made? Yes, yeah, so for the R01 mechanism, like I said before, we do intend to commit an estimated $2 million in fiscal year 2019 to fund up to three awards. And for the R21 mechanism, another three awards um, at a smaller amount of money at $1 million. Um, that's what we intend to do. Um, there may be some shifts in where that money is allocated. If we get more R01 grants or if we get more R21 grants, we, we may shift um, that around depending on how the review goes and, and what is submitted by our applicants. Great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we have someone asking, can an organization or a department in an organization submit more than one application to the FOA? Yes, the answer overall is yes. So an organization or department is welcome to submit more than one application if the research questions are distinct from one another. So there can't be overlapping aims. Um, the NIH can't accept duplicate or highly overlapping applications under the review at the same time. So 
So you can find further details on that under the RFA section. I think it's section three, number three, additional information on eligibility. Um, so you just want to make sure that there's no overlapping aims. So for example, if you have an R01 that's currently under review in a similar area or some, you have similar aims or the exact same aims, you can't also submit that to the RFA until after, I believe, you receive your summary statement for that one. Great. I guess I also just want to point out, we have Rick Berzon on the line from the National Institute on Minority Health and Disparities. Um, he is uh, one of the ICs who has signed on to this RSA. Um, and uh, so, Rick, I don't know if you want to chime in with any specifics around um, NIMHD priorities at this point in time. We're unmuting you. <laughs> We're having a technical problem at the moment. Sorry, Rick. We're trying to get you unmuted. We'll move on to the next question. Oh, Rick, we can hear you now. Are you there? Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Hi, Rick. Welcome. Hi. Great. So uh, I understand there's a, a question that is specific to NIMHD later on in the questions that are being reviewed. I can uh, jump ahead and answer it now. Yes, please go ahead, jump on in. So there was a, a question raised about primary research topics and questions of interest to NIMHD. And we are especially interested in smoking cessation interventions that are most effect effective among subgroups of persons living with HIV AIDS with disproportionately high smoking rates. So these include African Americans, American Indian, Alaska Natives, rural residents, sexual and gender minorities, individuals with mental illness, persons with substance abuse, uh, substance use disorders, and those of low socioeconomic status and medically underserved or insured, uninsured. So considering the diverse and unique needs of persons living with HIV, including culture, uh, country of origin, English language proficiency, socioeconomic status, and race ethnicity, um, uh, existing uh, smoking interventions can be adapted. How can uh, existing smoking interventions be adapted to reach uh, and be uh, effective in specific groups? And those were a couple of the questions that that are specific to NIMHD that I wanted to uh, share with you. Thank you so much, Rick. That was very, very helpful. Okay, uh, so we're going to go on to some other questions. Uh, we have an inquiry about what is considered evidence-based. So, for example, is an intervention with strong pilot data but not a large-scale trial considered evidence-based? Yeah, this is a this is a really good question and one I've I've been receiving inquiries over email on, um, which is why I tried to highlight that in my slides today. Um, so when we talk about evidence-based, I really want to, again, draw people back to the Clinical Practice Guideline 2008 update. And while that is 10 years old, there has been accumulating evidence um, for tobacco cessation interventions, I would say, in, in mobile health and in telephone counseling. Um, so, so in terms of strong pilot data, I would say it depends on what that pilot data is. Um, when, we, when we talk about evidence-based, we mean that there's a, an accumulation of research and literature out there that really shows that an intervention works. Um, so I encourage you to email me individually and we can discuss, discuss your pilot data um, to see if that, was, that would be something that would be responsive. And I think that's an opportunity for me to encourage those who are interested in applying to the RSA to reach out to either or both Annette or Rick, who can provide individual guidance and suggestions on the application. 
Okay, so let's go to the question of um, the fact that we have, we have actually, I'll back up to say, um, we, have two, we actually have two institutes participating in this RFA, uh, our National Cancer Institute and National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities. Uh, NIDA has, uh, we've recently learned that NIDA has, will no longer be participating. But uh, we have a questioner who would like to know, should we consider directing our application to one institution at NIH versus another? That's a great question. Um, the RSA uh, is, is coming out of NCI and NIMHD, um, but for review purposes, um, all applications will initially be assigned to the National Cancer Institute. Um, I will likely be your program director assigned. You can request NIMHD as a secondary assignment um, when in your cover letter when you apply. And depending on how review goes and, and what is decided to be funded, there, there may be an opportunity for us to switch institutions. So if your application is, is much more focused on NIMHD priorities, Rick Burzon um, may hold your grant. Um, at the end of the day, but all grants to start off, all applications will be held by the National Cancer Institute. And I'll, and I'll add, this is Michelle, and I would add to that to say I think that that's the type of question that at this stage an investigator does not need to be concerned about. We on the administrative level here at NIH will determine where eventually uh, individual applications uh, that are funded fit. Okay. Uh, we've got a question, is there going to be a list, oh, pardon me, will, a, will the list of members of the special emphasis panel, that is the review panel, uh, is it available or will it be available? So at this point, um, we do not have a list of the members for the SEP, um, the special emphasis panel. Um, that will be something I will need to follow up on if that will be made public or not. I'm not sure for RFAs if our, if the reviewers list is made public. Right, and I, and I will also add to that to say part of the reason we do not have a list available at the moment is that the list will be constructed from people who are deemed not to be in conflict with those who are applying. And actually this is a reason that we ask people to submit letters of intent. Letters of intent are not required, uh, but they help us just they help us determine how many applications will need to be reviewed, which reviewers are going to be in conflict, and thus cannot be uh, uh, invited to be reviewers. Uh, so that will that will that that does very much help us. Okay, uh, we have another question. Uh, given that there are two institutes that have applied, uh, or pardon me, that are on this RFA, and we have two program directors. If I want to, if someone wants to talk with a program director, which person should they reach out to? You can reach out to either one of us. Rick and I talk to each other. Um, you could reach out to both of us um, if you wanted us to both look at your aim. Um, so, so that is what we're here for: is to answer your questions and to and to help you determine if if your projects are responsive. Great. Okay, we have a question about mobile health apps. Uh, which the questioner notes have been tested in a few studies for smoking cessation, would mobile health apps be considered an evidence-based? Or pardon me, would, be, would they be considered to have a sufficient evidence base to be responsive? I, I think, again, it depends, though we would, um, please reach out to me with your specific aim so we can talk this through. Um, but yes, I think at the end of the day, there's a pretty emerging strong evidence base that mobile health apps um, do assist people in smoking cessation um, and, and can be effective. Great. Okay. I'm scrolling through our list of questions to see what else we need to cover. Okay. We have a question about the R21 mechanism, which, as we noted, is exploratory and developmental in nature. Um, can we talk a little bit about the requirements uh, for a control group in that context. Uh, and I'm, I'm actually just going to read the question to the group. If we are interested in developing or modifying an empirically supported approach, that specific intervention may not yet be evidence-based. 
but if we're developing an intervention, there may not be time resources to have a small trial, meaning that we would need a control group. So getting back to what is out there in the literature, one of the limitations that we're seeing is that um, we, we, the, the trials that have been done have lacked a control group, and we don't, we can't really assess if something that you're modifying um, or enhancing, a tobacco cessation intervention that you are modifying is going to work more than some sort of standard care. Um, so even in the cases of R21s, we are envisioning that you would include a control group. Um, at the very least, it would be um, standard of care, uh, either at wherever, whatever clinic you're working at, whatever the standard of care is for those individuals. Um, even better would be that they would be offered um, what would what would be kind of basic tobacco cessation, the five A's, uh, behavioral intervention, and some sort of nicotine replacement therapy or pharmacotherapy. Um, so yes, even for those R21s, we are expecting that there would be a control group or a comparison group for that intervention. Great. Another question. Um, the FOA mentions that applications need to relate to the NIH's stated HIV AIDS high priority areas. How will investigators know if they are actually working in these areas? So again, I encourage you to reach out to myself or to Rick Berzon um, to talk this through. Um, I, we will be posting these questions that are coming in along with our responses um, on our website, so, so you'll have access to this in the future um, as you're developing your applications. Um, but that notice that is in the RFA is really important. Um, so applications should not simply just implement smoking cessation for this population, but your aims, hypotheses, frameworks, and data collection and analyses should be integrative of HIV and the consequences of smoking and smoking cessation. So integration with HIV outcomes, um, and, and that's a requirement in this RFA, um, the consequences of smoking. So not just smoking itself, but what are the potential comorbidities of interest and, and data of, of those outcomes and harms, um, such as cardiovascular disorders or, or cancer. Um, so, so again, please refer back to that notice. Um, the Trans NIH plan is also very helpful. At the end of the day, um, like I said, this RFA was written to be responsive to the Office of AIDS Research. Um, so applications that come in, you know, will, will inherently be responsive, but we also want to make sure that you're, you're responsive to those HIV AIDS priorities at NIH. Right, and, and I would add to what Dr. Kaufman has said, I think it's worth everyone applying to take a quick look uh, at those priorities to get a sense of um, what they entail. There's a lot of very useful information there. Okay. Um, we have a question related to grantee meetings. Uh, will, will, do we anticipate that funded grants will be asked to come to grantee meetings? How will that work? Yeah, so typically this is sort of the fun part of RFAs is it's a network of investigators working in a similar area. And you'll see in the RFA um, that we've written in language around this, so you should budget for this, um, but there will be a grantee meeting likely annually that, that um, that grantees will be asked to attend, those R21 and R01, um, to talk about issues that are coming up in your research, common measures perhaps, um, and, and other things like that. So yes, there will be an annual, likely an annual grantee meeting. Terrific, thank you. Okay, we have a question regarding the definition of cessation. Uh, does cessation abstinent mean abstinence from cigarettes? Does it mean all tobacco products? Does it mean all combustible tobacco products? Does it require abstinence from e-cigarettes, for example? Yeah, so, so in this RFA, we really are focused on cigarette smoking. Um, so we want to know if these interventions are working specifically to drive down cigarette smoking um, rates and, and, at the end, cessation endpoints. Um, the cessation endpoints in the RFA um, should include quit attempts, and sustained abstinence among current smokers. Um, and we are encouraging biological verification of abstinence. Um, so this would also pick up other tobacco use. So that's something important to keep in mind. And I think if you're 
um, like we're asking is to uh, assess other tobacco use as well. Um, so you should be assessing everything, but really our focus is on cigarette smoking with this RFA. Um, and and in, in the RFA, we are asking that applicants do address e-cigarette use um, and assess use of e-cigarettes along with other tobacco products. Great, thank you. Uh, can you say something about the early stage investigator policy and how it will apply to this RSA? Yeah, so um, early stage investigator policy does apply to this RSA. Uh, so early stage investigator status does matter, um, even though this is an RFA, um, that it will be taken into account, um, you know, with your score and everything like that. Um, so yeah, it applies. Thank you. Uh, so let's go to, would a project preparing evidence-based implementation strategies to increase uptake of smoking cessation and treatment among this population be considered responsive? Yeah, if it's, um, if it's an intervention that you're testing with a control group, then yes, I believe that this would be responsive. I would encourage this person to reach out to me so we can discuss. I think that's I think that's a good I think that's always a good idea. Okay. Uh, next question. Uh, being a relative relatively small subpopulation, would an RCT with a goal of a hundred participants in each of two arms be considered sufficient, even though it might likely be statistically underpowered? I am not a reviewer, but I'm not sure, it may be responsive, um, but I'm not sure how that uh, application like this would fare in review. Exactly, and, and that's an opportunity to discuss the difference between responsive to the request for applications, meaning that it is um, judged to be fitting under this RFA, which allows it to be go which allows it to go to the review group but then of course there is the rigorous scientific review which is a very which is a, a separate animal and uh, on a question like this um, I think a review group would have difficulty with a project that does not have sufficient power I agree yeah. okay um, we had a question about another question about funding. We indicate that there is $2 million designated for up to three R01s. Uh, so we want to know, does that include both the total direct and indirect costs, or is this simply reflecting direct costs? I think this would be reflective of the total. So this is the, this is the money that we have to give um, in total. Right. That's our, I would agree. That's the estimated amount of funds that the institutes together have put forward for these projects. Okay, hang on, we're just checking to see if we have additional questions coming in. Hi. Probably it. Do we have any more? Oh, up. Give us one minute while we look at the population of questions. Hang on a moment, folks, on the phone. Okay, uh, another question has come through. How will the NIH Science of Behavior Change model be applied to this RSA? Well, it's always good to have a question that we don't know the answer to. <laughs> I, we will be posting this question um, 
online and, and uh, we'll have an answer for you. Um, we will look into it. Agree. That's one we'll look into. That's, that's part of why we do these webinars is to uh, get all the questions that we don't have an answer to. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next question. Will a pilot trial conducted in an R21 be considered a clinical trial for administrative paper purposes? Yeah, so as many of you know, we have a revised uh, definition of what a clinical trial is at NIH. Um, and I would say that pretty much everything coming in under this RFA would be designated under the clinical trial um, because uh, we are, you would be comparing two, two different groups. Um, and testing two different groups and comparing them. So yes, I think for administrative purposes, paperwork purposes, all of all of the applications we anticipate will be clinical trials. Okay, uh, next question. Um, we are using the phrase control or comparison group. So does that mean that a project could compare two different pharmacotherapies, for example. Yes, yes, a, a project could compare two drugs. Um, and I think this is really important, especially for this population. So keeping our eye on people living with HIV, very little research has examined, you know, drug interactions with ART and, and other issues around pharmacotherapies and how they may be um, tolerated by this population. Um, there have been a few studies, but not many. So I think this is actually a really um, interesting research question. And that kind of reminds me um, to mention a, about um, innovation. And when the review group is convened, uh, we, hope, we hope that uh, we are able to speak with them and let them know that in a, innovation in this context means something a little bit different. Um, so we're not looking for, you know, crazy new interventions to be developed under this RFA. Really, the focus is on understanding and testing the interventions, tobacco cessation interventions that currently exist and modifications to those to see if they work in this population. And that in and of itself is innovative because we, we just haven't looked at this, um, these questions in this population before. Right, exactly, exactly. All right, we have another question that came through on the orbit model, uh, which I think is going to be another one in the category that we cannot answer. This person is asking, would the orbit model be an appropriate model to frame an R21 mechanism in our new intervention? We will get back to you on that. We will get back to you on that. All right, it looks like our, our questions have slowed down. Yes. I think we I think we're out of questions. Um, again, I want to thank everyone for participating in the webinar. We're delighted that there's so much interest in the funding opportunity announcements out in the field. Uh, we want to thank our colleague Rick at NIMHD Minority Health and Health Disparities for joining us. Please, for the pro, for the scientists on the phone, do uh, feel free to encourage you. To, I encourage you to reach out to either Annette or Rick. Uh, to discuss your specific applications, and we look forward to seeing first your letters of intent and then your applications uh, at the appropriate due date. Thank you.